Okay, so good evening, everyone. My name is Mahela, and I'm the Public Programs Coordinator at Historic Saranac Lake. Welcome to this evening's program, Retracing Bartok from Transylvania to Saranac Lake, Bella Bartok's Lifelong Affair with Folk Music, presented by Lucian Vaughn. This program is part of a series in celebration of composer Bella Bartok, who spent three summers in Saranac Lake. You can find more information about this series, uh, access recordings of previous programs, um, and register for upcoming programs at historicsaranaclake.org slash celebrating dash Bartok. I will put that in the chat in a moment. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Lucian Bond was raised in a small village in Northwest Transylvania in the region where Bartok did his most extensive research and collecting of folk songs. Uh, Mr. Bond studied composition at the Bucharest Music Academy while simultaneously leading his own jazz groups. A desire to get closer to the source of jazz brought him to the United States. Since moving from Romania to New York in 1999, he has been leading several projects creating music that reinvents the jazz idiom, collaborating with some of today's most celebrated jazz musicians. His compositions are performed and recorded by several ensembles, and he has released 19 albums while maintaining a worldwide touring schedule. In 2020, he released Transylvanian Folk Songs in trio, trio with Matt Maneri and legendary John Sermon, Imagining Bella Bartok's collection of folk, so folk songs of Romanian people in Transylvania. And you can learn more about his work at his website, lucianbond.com. I will also link that in the chat. Uh, finally, please note that we are recording this presentation. It will be available following the program on our YouTube channel, and we will also share a link with everyone who is registered. I do recommend that everyone uh, mutes their microphones until the Q&A portion at the end of the presentation. And then uh, please feel free during that portion to unmute to ask a question, or if you'd prefer, you can type your question into the chat and I will lead it, read it aloud for you. Um, and with that, we are going to hand things over to Lucian and get started. Bear with me while I share my screen. You. Lucian, are you all set to get started? Yes, you can you can start the trailer. Oh, okay. Thank 
the fuck is this? We can go next. Just go back one, please, Mahela. Back, back. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> that one, perfect. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Can everybody hear me? Think I think we can hear you. Wonderful. So uh, uh, this is uh, this is pianist Lucien Bon, uh, joining in from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, it's a pleasure to do this uh, uh, talk on uh, Bartok's love for Romanian folk music. I want to thank uh, 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 historic Saranac Lake for having me. I want to thank Amy Catania and uh, Mahala for getting this together, and everyone who joined uh, to uh, making the time to to listen to me. So. Um, Bartok and folk music, it's such a large subject. Uh, uh, many books have been written and studies, and I came upon this somehow by happenstance. So let me tell you two stories, short stories that will give you a context on um, my involvement with Bartok's research in uh, uh, the music, the folk music of my country. So first story, it's a rather mundane story, uh, like four years ago before the pandemic, I was uh, doing a, a short vacation drive going up north from New York to Vermont. And uh, I stopped uh, with my partner in uh, Saranac Lake. Uh, it's a beautiful, as everybody knows, it's such a beautiful uh, little town up in the uh, mountains. And uh, while we were walking at night to grab something to eat, I saw something in the sidewalk. So the Saranac Lake has a, Walk of Fame thing, uh, downtown, uh, and uh, there's all kinds of names that I did not know. I think some of them were connected to the history of Saranac Lake with the, uh, the, with the treatment and cure of tuberculosis, but there were other names of people I did not know, like basketball players, and suddenly I saw a star with Bar Bella Bartok's name on, and I was like baffled about it. I said, this is strange. What has to do this beautiful little northeastern American town uh, with uh, Bella Bartok? And on a whim, in the next morning when I wake up, uh, I called historic Saranac Lake. And uh, the person that answered my call was Amy Catania. And she was so welcoming and so open to, to my questions and uh, immediately invited me to, to meet with her. and. Uh, to take me to what we know now, it's uh, Bella Bartok's cabin uh, up in Saranac Lake. So thus I found out uh, Bartok's history, personal history with, with this uh, uh, beautiful um, uh, little town in, in uh, Northern America. So uh, it turns out that uh, Bartok spent his last years of his life going every summer up there to treat his condition uh, we know now that he had emphysema, so uh, uh, he probably he went up there because of, of uh, Saranac Lake's um, history with treat treatment of people with uh, uh, respiratory problems. But it went much more deep than this. So Bartok finished a lot of his uh, uh, work of his last years up there. For example, he finished his viola concerto there. But he also uh, and annotated uh, the last touches on what he called his major written opus in terms of ethnomusicology, which is the Romanian folk music. So uh, this is my uh, my little uh, story to 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 introduce how I got connected to Saranac Lake and to historic Saranac Lake and what uh, these wonderful people are doing there in regards to. Bartok's presence in that hometown. Now the cabin, I, I understand, was either bought or it's under the management of Historic Lake Society, Historic Saranac Lake Society, and it's a very humble cabin. I don't know if how many people who who are 
uh, watching or listening to this are um, they know this. I was I was stunned to see how humble is that cabin. It's it has very low ceilings, a bed that looks more like a like a room in 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 a, in a in a cottage in, in you know in uh, in uh, old Russia or something you know and uh, I was surprised to see that Bartok uh, chose this place uh, to spend his last summers uh, to get away from New York but then as as I've learned more about Bartok the man the 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 human. I was not so surprised because Bartok was mostly, mostly interested in his work and not in the comforts of life. Uh, we know that his life in the United States was not the most happy one. He was sick. He wasn't doing very well. He was actually run rather under some, you could call it poverty. He had some residences up from Harvard and some uh, other people and institutions that uh, assisted him, but it wasn't that easy for him. Uh, as as I've learned, uh, all the way to his last months of life, he worked and annotated on the collection of the studies and the texts on Romanian folk music. This I'm getting a lot of echo, uh, Mahala here. I think um, if someone has their microphone on, can you double check that you're that you're muted, please? Okay, we're good to go. Uh, so we um, so let me uh, go right in. In 2018, I started uh, a project with uh, uh, under the uh, the frame of um, Timisoara European Capital of Culture. Uh, this is a, a, a project of, of the European uh, community uh, where each year uh, two or three cities uh, win this uh, title to host what they call a, a European capital of culture. And it's, um, it's a big project that uh, it's sort of rejuvenation for each of these cities that are hosting this, this uh, uh, capital of culture thing. And a lot of projects are developed, infrastructure is developed in those cities, and there's a, a sort of a frenzy of uh, uh, a cultural uh, events and life that uh, uh, bring a lot of, uh, uh, how should I put it, a lot of um, good things to those cities. So um, uh, I started this project with uh, uh, a local organization that I used to collaborate with putting jazz concerts called Jazz Updates. They're wonderful people in Timisoara. Timisoara is the city uh, that started the Romanian revolution in 89. And it's uh, kind of the major city in the Western part of Romania. And uh, I got to perform there several times in the last year or working with these uh, people at Jazz Updates. And uh, together with them, I developed a project called Retracing Bartok. Now this project uh, was to tell the story of Bartok's love with Transylvania, with Romanian people and Romanian folk music. I knew about Bartok's research in Romania, in Transylvania, but did not know the depth of his passion and love for the music and the people of my country. Uh, so it turns out, as the quote from Bartok says right there, that uh, Bartok, just to read it out loud, uh, once he started, uh, researching and collecting uh, Romanian folk music, he considered it his life goal. Just to quote, I consider it my life goal in life to continue my study, study of Romanian folk music, at least in Transylvania, and carried it to its end. And this is what he did for his whole life, all the way he, I think till several weeks before he passed away, he worked on annotating and expanding and putting his, the, finest, uh, the final touches on, on his uh, research work. Now, we do know that Bartok uh, was a pioneer in the field of uh, ethnomusicology and field collecting uh, at the end of 19th century and starting in 20th century. And uh, he started doing this very early. Bartok was born in uh, 
uh, in a little city, probably like 25 miles west of Timisoara, that it's in Romania today. It was in the Habsburgic Empire at the end of 19th century, called San Nicolao Mare. And uh, although uh, he moved away from San Nicolao Mare uh, in his late teens, uh, his father died early, uh, and then his mom moved to Ukraine in a little city. Then he, he came back with him uh, in Oradea, which is another city uh, in uh, uh, Western Transylvania. And then he moved again to a city close to where I was born in Bistrisa, where he did, he went to the German school there. And then probably close to where he was, I think 17 or 18 years old, he heard when he, when he was with his mom in a, in a little resort vacation, he heard uh, their maid singing a folk song. He was stunned. Uh, that the maid's name is uh, Lily Dosa, and uh, he immediately asked her, "What is this?" And the woman said, uh, "It's a folk song from Transylvania that I learned from my parents." Uh, he was so intrigued that immediately he wanted to do more to learn more about this, and um, he. This is what he did actually. So starting with 1907. I'm sorry, 1909, all the way to 1917, Bartok did somewhere between 24 and 28 field research trips, starting recording folk music in little villages in uh, uh, Transylvania. Uh, there's been a lot of writing and research done on this. And uh, some of the most uh, uh, profound uh, research was done by a musicologist in my hometown in Cluj-Napoca, that, uh, that's in, in the middle of Transylvania. It's the biggest city in Transylvania. His name is Francis Glaslo. I never got to meet him. He died in 2006, but uh, he was, he's considered today one of the foremost experts in Bartok. And uh, what he did actually, he uh, went deep down researching all kinds of archival sources in Romania. And mind you, this is done in communism. Uh, Francis Glaslo uh, lived his entire life uh, uh, in Transylvania, in Cluj and Bucharest. And he was an uh, uh, ethnomusicologist and a musicologist. And uh, he researched uh, archives from before the war and before Romania was uh, under communist rule. And he was able to uh, actually document each trip that Bartok did in Transylvania, this is some pretty serious detective work. And uh, it speaks to Francis Glaslow's uh, extraordinary passion and love for what Bartok researched uh, in Transylvania. Uh, Francis Glaslow went on to, to write several books, a uh, dozen of studies, and he found out some fascinating things. And uh, uh, more than this, and as I will show uh, a little later on, on, on the, this PowerPoint presentation, he even found some of the young uh, girls that by 1960s, the late, late 60s, early 70s, when Francis Laszlo was doing his research on Bartok field recordings, were like in their late 70s and 80s. And he found some of the girls that recorded, sang, not recorded, sang for Bartok somewhere be probably around 19, uh, 10, 1911, 1912. This is quite an amazing story. And uh, I got to learn this by meeting uh, Francis Glaslow widow, the cellist uh, uh, Elsa Herbert that still lives in Cluj and was so gracious and uh, uh, welcoming to, uh, to uh, show me her late husband research and house and books and studies. Uh, Mahela, can we go forward please? Okay, uh, let me see if we are on. Wonderful. So the photo that you see here, it's uh, it's a famous photo that is uh, uh, a lot of times uh, associated with Bartok's, uh, when people talk about Bartok's research. So as we can see, it's, uh, uh, it's a photo that uh, it's clearly from uh, either uh, 
late last years of 19th century or uh, or early 21st years of 20th century. It's not actually in Transylvania. There's no photograph uh, that we have today with Bartok's collecting in Transylvania. We do have some other photographs that Bartok took in Transylvania, which I'll show you. But this one, it's a, it's a famous photo of Bartok collecting and recording uh, peasants in Slovakia. And uh, before that, we had a photo. Uh, if Mihaela, you can go back one slide, please. Wonderful, thank you. So this is a, this is a photograph. This is from late uh, 19th century. Uh, and it's a photograph of Bartok, the folk collector. We see the, uh, the costumes and the, the clothes and, which, and the big boots. And this one, uh, uh, it's most likely was done uh, for Bartok's applications for various funding to do his research trips. And uh, this is, uh, as many of the photographs that I'm using and uh, I was able to use for my album are part of uh, Budapest Bartok archives, which were very, very nice with me and uh, uh, to let me use them. Uh, Mihela, we can go forward back. Uh, and uh, in these trips, uh, Bartok actually started in 1909. And uh, Francis Glasslow, actually was able to uncover from letters that Bartok wrote, from uh, reports that he submitted to the uh, Budapest Ar uh, Academy of uh, Music uh, to get back reimbursements for his costs. We were able to, to Francis uh, Laszlo was able to actually uh, pin down what Bartok did in this field research uh, trips. So he was going for, probably five to two to 10, 12 days in an area in Transylvania. And he was trying to connect with local uh, professors or local priests, which then will connect him to people willing to sing into what we call today the Edison phonograph, which I, at that time would use wax cylinders to record. Now there's some very there's some uh, very funny and uh, uh, moving uh, uh, details that we find out in his letters and uh, were uh, added in uh, Francis Glassler research, like how to convince little girls, young girls, teenagers, to sing for him or uh, peasants to sing for him. And he Bartoy actually uh, wrote down some very moving things, like I had to use plum brandy to convince. Uh, young peasants to sing for me and I paid this amount of money uh, and this is uh, the, the reason for this was not he was not trying to be funny he wanted to be reimbursed for these costs as we move on with Bartok's trips in uh, Transylvania uh, we learn more and more what was his uh, uh, modus operandi in doing those trips and he got better at it we have to realize that uh, Almost nobody at, in late 19th century was doing this kind of uh, uh, folk research where they would go and record people singing. By that time, recording uh, technology was barely, barely appearing with the Edison phonograph. And uh, Bartok made amazing use of it, of this technology. And it, it is the reason this. Uh, discipline of ethnomusicology and field recording exists today and it's over 125 years long because Bartok and people like him started using it to record uh, people in, in the field. And uh, we do know now that Bartok is considered one, uh, on one of the pioneers of this field because he was truly one of the first ones, but not only one of the first ones to record one of the first ones to, to uh, develop the methodology to record, to transcribe, to notate, to group, to catalog, and to explain, uh, to try to explain the way uh, folk music and folk songs should be recorded and analyzed. 
And uh, what we know today is that he changed his and fine-tuned his uh, techniques and methodology from one trip to another, from one publication to another. Um, Hela, can we go forward, please? Thank you. So let me give you some numbers here. Between 1908, actually, that's a mistake. It's, it's my mistake. Between 1909 and 1917, Bella Bartok collected, recorded, and transcribed a whipping 3,379 Romanian folk songs in approximate 28 field trips in Transylvania, Banat, and counties in today's Hungary. Now, this is, if we can try to imagine, uh, this is an extraordinary number. And Bartok by himself, together with his first wife, learned Romanian, changed the letters on the typewriter machine to Romanian language from Hungarian, and transcribed all these 3,379 songs. If we come do a comparison chart with other uh, uh, folk songs that he collected during his entire life, we see the difference. He collected uh, uh, 2,700 Hungarian folk songs, 2,500 Slovakian folk songs, a little over 100 Arabian folk songs, which is Northern Africa and Algeria, in Algeria, and a little over 100 Turkish folk songs in 1935, and probably like a hundred other nationalities, Ukrainian, Serbian, and Bulgarian. This is, if we, if we just pause a moment at the beginning of a, of a discipline that barely existed in over, over a period of 10 years during which we, Europe was suffering tremendous historical upheaval. They had, a, we had the first world war and just to be uh, connected to what we went through, we, they had the Spanish flu, another pandemic. And Bartok still went ahead and did this amazing and extraordinary uh, work of going in the fields and record, record and record and record. And um, we do know now uh, through the work of various Bartok experts, what a tremendous influence was on his own voice as a composer. The music that he researched, the folk music of Transylvania, Hungary, Slovakia, uh, was, uh, had a tremendous impact in his way of composing. Uh, Mihaela, can we go forward, please? Wonderful. So this is the local school in San Nicolau Mare. Uh, at the beginning of 20th century. Uh, this was actually the school where uh, children of uh, uh, people like Bartok's uh, uh, father would send their children. Uh, and uh, it doesn't exist anymore today. Uh, I got to visit San Nicola Omare. I even got to perform there in the local uh, palace it's a small palace of the uh at that at that time end of 19th century was the uh the richest person in the area landowner and he had the palace his name was nako and the palace is called today nako and uh bartok's ha birth house doesn't exist anymore and uh, there's a local uh pharmacist who is very much involved in keeping bartok's memory alive and he built a small museum i got to know him and i got to work with him on our project retracing bartok uh what bartok did going forward and uh Mihaela, can we go forward please uh so what we see here it's uh, a phonograph that mo uh, that uh, was used by bartok and the wax cylinders and i will play you some later just a little later how is uh, uh, a digital transcription of, uh, of the recording from a wax cylinder. They don't sound pretty good, according to our standards. We can go forward, Mihaela, please. So this is actually a photograph that I took in the little museum. It's not a, even a proper museum that's in Sinacolao Mare that was built by this pharmacist. 
that uh, uh, such a huge fan of Bartok's uh, uh, connection with Nicola Omara. We can go forward, Mahelo. Uh, these are two photo fascinating photographs. Uh, on the left, we have Bartok and Kodali, and Kodali's, uh, I think, Kodal Kodali's wife or partner at the time in 1912. Bartok is in on the right. And the photography on the right, it's uh, uh, an even more fascinating one because I did find where it's taken. Uh, it's Bartok together with a local priest who became a lifelong friend of Bartok and helped in his research trips in the uh, Apusen Mountains, which are the main mountains in Western Transylvania, and Kodali again. This one is taken uh, in uh, Stuna de Valle. This is a little resort in Apusen Mountain, and this was taken in 1918. And it's, um, it's a beautiful photograph. We can see uh, the priest uh, standing, uh, 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 and then Bartok in the middle sitting, and uh, Kodali on the right. And uh, the way would Bartok would work in his research trips is that he would connect with the priests or the local professor. And uh, quite a few times, these people were themselves folk enthusiasts or ethnomusicologists themselves. Uh, the person, uh, I don't have a photograph of him because I couldn't find one. The priest in Maramures, which is the northern part of Transylvania, was a collector himself. So Bartok, it's important to realize that Bartok would uh, connect with these people that would be of tremendous help for him. Uh, he would either live with them or uh, just uh, uh, talk to them to get people to sing for him. Because you cannot go into these small villages uh, at the end of 19th century or beginning of 20th century and just you know imagine that people will come and sing for you. So an interface, somebody who knew, a local person who would know uh, uh, the local people uh, would be of extreme importance for Bartok to get them to record. Now, in each of these uh, 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 record trips, Bartok would collect, he would have uh, various degrees of uh, success in terms of how much he would be able to collect. Some trips would, would uh, bring 40 or 50 songs. Other trips would bring 40, 100 songs. Uh, other trips would bring less and more, or some would be of, uh, of a quality that didn't pass Bartok's standards. Uh, uh, can we go forward, Mahalo, please? This is a, st a standard uh, uh, photograph that uh, uh, it's uh, uh, been used in pretty much every time when people are talking about Bartok transcribing. Now, uh, we will hear immediately uh, how these recordings sound. What I want to say is that uh, during these 28 field trips, we have today what is considered still the largest collection done by one person, even by, even by today's uh, standards. Like in Romania, we have now there's been a lot of field recordings done, but it was all, they were always done in a team effort. So there's bigger collections of uh, Transylvanian folk songs or Romanian folk songs done in the past century by, you know, the Romanian Institute of Ethnomusicology and by other uh, uh, famous people like uh, Brailoyu, for example, uh, but none of them collected over 3000 songs. So even, Today, Bartok's collection of Romanian folk music in Transylvania stands out by the sheer amount of uh, recordings that were done at the beginning of 20th century. We can go forward, please, Mihailo. So now I'm, uh, I have here, a, uh, you know, photographs, facsimiles of Bartok's own handwriting and the way he would transcribe the songs. So he had a, a catalog system with with a number MF or MM uh, that he did it and he revised and we can see the date and we can see his name on the right and we can almost see let me see if I can see it bigger uh, some notes that he did and uh, 
wrote down on each page, like who would sing to him, like two uh, women or two young children or uh, a peasant or a shepherd or uh, people that were illiterate. He, he actually would write down uh, things like these. And then we can see on the, on the songs that were like vocal ones, he transcribed the lyrics. Bartok, together with his first wife, learned Romanian to be able to transcribe those lyrics. And all the way to his last years in the United States, he corresponded with Romanian immigrants, like a, a, a priest in Chicago, to double check if he got right the transcriptions. All the way to his last uh, years, and probably to even when he was up in Saranac Lake, when he we know that he worked on on those uh, on uh, on those papers of him on his collections. He took when he immigrated in 1941 from uh, uh, from uh, Europe from Hungary to to uh, United States to get away from fascism. He actually uh, made he had his assistant making copies of all his research paper on Romanian folk music, and he left the originals in Hungary, but he took copies of everything he researched to the United States because he wanted to still work on them. Can we go forward, please? And we are gonna, before you press play, uh, this is uh, the famous uh, Romanian uh, conductor, uh, Sergiu Celibidache, uh, conducting uh, the first, uh, song of uh, Transylvanian folk dances, and this one is called the uh, the we call it Zokul Kubuta in Romanian. It also has a Hungarian name, but in English it's something the uh, the the stick game. And uh, I will show you something truly fascinating fascinating that I found during my little research on retracing Bartok. So let's play this this clip from from uh, Celibidache. I think it was Berlin Philharmonic playing the first uh, song of uh, the Transylvanian dances. Perfect. Let's go to the next one, Mehela, please. Now, before hitting play, I uh, I just want to say, so we probably all know this famous song. This is an, an orchestral arrangement of his original composition that was done for piano. Then was, there's a version with for uh, violin and piano, and we have famous recordings with uh, uh, Yehudi Menuhin and also with uh, Oistrakh on violin. What I did find out and it's a it's a fascinating find. It's the original wax cylinder recording of the song that is, it's the inspiration of what we just heard. Uh, now this is a digital uh, version of what was recorded uh, by Bartok and on a wax cylinder that it's now at the uh, ethnographic museum in Budapest, and I got access to it to the. Uh, uh, grace of uh, wonderful people at uh, uh, Budapest Bartok Archives. archives. Mahala, can you press play, press play on this one? Thank <laughs> you. 
Perfect, and we can move forward. Okay, uh, I'm gonna read uh, uh, the, the quote from Bartok that's on the previous slide. And he says this about, uh, about the music and, the, uh, and about the state of what he found when he was doing this, uh, these recordings. This characteristic archaic state a morsel of Middle Ages has persisted among the Romanians in its original and uncorrupted form till our days. A veritable El Dorado for the research who feels that he has traveled several hundred years back in time. If with great pain one manages to overcome the girl's timidity and three or four girls start to sing the marvelously ornamented oscillating rubato melody in pitch perfect harmony and with a resounding chest voice, one would imagine being in an enchanted fairy tale. So the reason that Bartok loved and collected so much uh, folk songs in Transylvania, we know now it's a very clear one. He considered and argued and uh, posited that music of Romanian people in Western Transylvania was in a pure state, unaltered by history, the way other places around in Hungary, uh, Romania, Slovakia, uh, to uh, what we call today Austria, was happening even at the end of 19th century and the beginning of 20th century. The remoteness of Romanian villages where he would do, was doing his field trips uh, basically ensured that the culture and the music of these people, of the peasants, was so rich and so unaffected by influences from outside. And we do know now that folk music, it's anything but not influenced by other inf but influences from outside. And this is happening constantly and it happened back then. For example, a lot of the, uh, what we call, we would call the, the popular music of the era in the mid uh, 19th century, was influenced by a, a commercial music that was played in coffee places, that was uh, uh, played in, in uh, places like these, and was fast and uh, substantially altering the folklore, the folk music. What Bartok found in these villages and in Transylvania, in Western Transylvanian uh, villages was an unaltered repository of, of uh, very, uh, old music in a way and uh he was fascinated by this and he was right on his instinct that this music has to be documented because it shows us an insight into something that's very meaningful and it actually was the basis of his thesis on uh folk music which he sent all folk music throughout the globe comes from the same cell there's debate on the on the on those theories, but I still believe it's kind of true. Uh, but he was Barto was able to to make these points because he was able to record music that was in such a pure form. Um, Hela, can we go forward, please? I need to move faster because I'm feeling that I, I'm moving too slow. These are uh, uh, hand transcriptions of Bartok's. Uh, uh, pages where he transcribed the lyrics and then on the right we have another uh, eight measure song can we go forward please now this is the uh, the facsimile uh, uh, of the first study that Bartok published on Romanian folk songs uh, the title uh, will translate uh, folk uh, uh, Romanian folk songs in, in French, the, the, there's a uh, title in French, Chanson Populaire Romaine. And this was published by the Romanian uh, Academy. 
And uh, this is very interesting to know that Bartok collaborated with the Romanian Academy at the beginning of the century and having them to pay for half of his field trips and the other half was paid by the Hungarian Academy and Romanian Academy published and paid for the publishing of the first study, which was done in 1911. Uh, let's go forward, please. Uh, Bartok went on to, in, uh, to collect over 3,000 and he, uh, he grouped them in, a, uh, in four categories, vocal melodies, carols, uh, instrumental melodies, and let me see the other ones, I'm not missing, Instru and uh, texts. And then he had carols and Christmas songs. Now, what he says here is that the carols actually, we must not think of carols or kolinde, how we call them in Romanian, in terms of the religious Christmas carols of the West. Instead of the Bethlehem legend, we hear about the wonderful battle between the victorious hero and the unwanked lion or stag, we are told the tale of nine sons who, after hunting for so many years in the old forest, have been changed into stags, or we listen to a marvelous story about the son who has asked in marriage the hand of his sister, the moon, and so on. Thus, says Bartok, here are texts truly preserved from ancient pagan times. So what this tells us is actually that the culture and the folk music of uh, people had less to do with the re religious uh, mores than what we think, usually think about it. We always thought that religion governed everything, uh, starting with, you know, with the uh, ancient times all the way to the 20, 19th and 20th century. That is not true. The genius of folk people is to transform this and speak to their issues and their lives. Uh, let's uh, please go forward. Uh, this, and together with the uh, slide 14, can you go back to slide 14, please, Mihaela? There's three photos. Yes. These are photographs that uh, were never printed. Uh, they are in the, uh, 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 the vaults of the Budapest Bartok archives, and they were kind enough to let me use them and uh, they were for the first time printed in the booklet of my album or uh, Transylvanian folk songs, the Bella Bartok field recordings. Actually, uh, one of the photographs, the one on the right, uh, was used by our designer uh, on the main cover of the album. And all of the other ones, uh, and this is truly uh, amazing, uh, all of these photographs, there were like 11 in total. We have uh, were taken by Bela Bartok himself in Transylvania at the beginning of the 20th century. The particular ones that you see now were taken in a village called Severshin near Arad. This is a, a medium-sized town uh, near the border with Hungary. Uh, let's go back, uh, please, uh, Mihaela, to number 19. These are the covers of the subsequent studies published by Bartok on Romanian uh, folk music. Uh, I'm talking number 19, that, this is the one. So the, the one on the left, it's the, uh, uh, the title says in German, the Romanian, uh, uh, the music of the Romanians from Maramures. This was published in 1923 in uh, Germany in München. Now, this was published with his own money because what happened since 19, uh, 11, when he published his first studies, it's, we had the First World War, and then in 1918, Transylvania became part of what we call modern day Romania. And we had some serious problems uh, that Bartok encountered with his people in Budapest and with Romania. People in Budapest accused Bartok of treason by studying the, and collecting the folk music of Romania. And people in Romania was looking suspiciously, suspiciously uh, uh, at Bartok now. But he wanted to get this out, his research, because he didn't care about uh, these problems, these issues, these political issues. He knew what was truly important. So he put his own money, and throughout his life, he tried to get funding, which he did not get, actually. 
to publish the study. The next one on the right, it's uh, called, again, it's, I'm translating from German, uh, uh, Melodies of Romanian Carols. This was published in Vienna in 1935. And then let's go forward. Uh, one more, because I'm not going to dwell on this one. And this one are the covers of the fifth volumes. Well, we only have the four volumes here because uh, there was no space on the slide of the monumental Romanian folk music collection that was published after Bartlock uh, passed away by uh, uh, his uh, 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 how do you call it? estate. Uh, uh, how do you call? It? What's the name of this? He was in charge of Bartok's estate and. Uh, he was also a musicologist himself, Benjamin Sukov, and he published those in 1967 uh, at a publishing house, uh, Martin Nijov in The Hague. And each volume has between 500 and 600 pages. Uh, four of them contain scores, and the last one is, is just the transcription of the text. They are all out of print. Uh, you can find them in some libraries at universities. So the original uh, uh, prints, you can find some edition of them and on eBay for hundreds of dollars, but you cannot find them now to buy them. Uh, even for my project, I had access not to a book, but to PDF versions of it. Let's go forward, please. Let's skip this one because it's too much time. It's too little time. Let's skip this one, please the slide. I just wanted to show you a poster that is uh, uh, an amazing find. This is a poster of a concert that Bartok gave in Bucharest in October of 1924, together with the famous Romanian composer uh, uh, on piano, George Enescu. They were playing uh, Romanian carols for piano by, uh, they were playing an, uh, of an entire Bartok program. We had the, the, the renowned uh, ethnomusicologist Konstantin Broiloyu uh, introducing the concert. And then we had uh, the first quartet, string quartet by Bartok. Uh, and then we had Romanian carols for piano. And then we had the, uh, the uh, sonata of violin and piano where uh, Bartok was playing piano and Georgianesque was playing violin. And then we had pieces for piano with uh, Bartok at the piano. This was, this took place at the Union of Journalists in Bucharest and was funded by the Society of Romanian Composers, 1924. Let's go forward, please, Mihaela. This one in 1940, to get away from fascism, Bartok emigrates to America, where, and this is getting close to me, who I'm a jazz pianist, where we find him collaborating with famous jazz clarinetist Benny Goodman and violinist Joseph Zigetti on his composition Contrast. On this uh, rare photograph, we see Bartok at piano, uh, Zigetti on violin, and, and Goodman on the right uh, uh, playing clarinet. Let's move forward. Uh, I'm quoting from the essay that uh, Steve Lake from ECM Records wrote for our album. And this is how uh, uh, he, he says, after a short introduction about Bartok. A century later, three outstanding improvisers, Matt Maneri, Lucian Ban, and John Sermon, draw fresh inspiration from the music that fired Bartok's imagination, looking again at carols, lamentations, love songs, dowry songs, and more, which the composer collected in the period from 1909 to 1917. And below we see the front cover and the back cover of uh, our album, Transylvanian Folk Songs, the Bell of Bartok Field Recordings. Please note that the main cover features a stunning photograph that Bartok took in Transylvania himself in this little village, Sebrushin. Uh, let's move forward, please. Our project that uh, we did in uh, Timisoara uh, under the, uh, the frame of uh, European Capital of Culture featured uh, John Sermon, the legendary John Sermon, uh, uh, baritone. Uh, I will respond to that question uh, on bass, clarinet, soprano, and baritone, and uh, uh, the great uh, Matt Mannery on viola. This is a poster of one of the events that we had. Uh, as you can see, on November 
six in, in 2019, I think, 2018, we had the concert at the Baroque Hall at, at the Museum of Art in Timisoara. And on November 8th, we had the concert at Naco Ca uh, uh, Castle in San Nicolau Mare. Let's move forward. Uh, and I'm going to answer to the question put a dowry song. It's a song uh, that describes, uh, I guess, uh, talks about the dowry that uh, uh, a young woman would uh, have, have when she would marry uh, her, her husband. And it's the song that opens our album. And it's the song that you will see here. I have a short uh, excerpt from a video excerpt from our concert in uh, Bartok's birthplace in Sinicola Omare. This one, this uh, slide shows me with uh, uh, Elsa Herbert, uh, the widow of uh, Bartok expert Francis Laszlo that I talked so much and I learned so much uh, from his books and studies on uh, Bartok's research in Transylvania. This was taken at their home in Cluj-Napoca, which is also my birth town. She was so gracious. And on the left, uh, even there in the back of uh, the, uh, the two of us, you can see uh, one of their uh, bookshelves. And on the left, you see uh, a, a photograph. That is Francis Glasslo, beginning of, of the 70s, with an old woman. This is an old woman that, uh, a woman that Francis Glasslo found and in, in I don't know where. And it's one of the women uh, that sang to Bartok when she was six or seven or 10 years old at the beginning of 20th century. Laszlo was indeed a tremendous researcher and his work is extraordinary on, on what Bartok did in, in Transylvania. Let's move forward. And we can play straight play. This is violist Matt Maneri talking on folk music. Folk music was uh, in general was always a big part of my life. My father was a musician as well, and uh, he was very interested in, in, in New York City at the time he was coming up. He had to play a lot of weddings and he had to learn a lot of different cultures of different folk music. So he enjoyed playing clarinet, a lot of these different cultures. So I grew up with those kind of melodies kind of in my head as a, a kid, and I always enjoyed them. I think they make a great improvisation, um, like the American spirituals or the, or the Greek doinas, or, or you know, everybody has their kind of bluesy spiritual kind of voice, you know, cries out. And I, I was very attracted to that, so it's a natural fit for improvisation. Move forward, please. There's two photographs here. It's us before the concert in Timisoara, the Baroque Hall, and us in uh, San Nicolau Mare at the little museum that the pharmacist, the local pharmacist, built for uh, to celebrate Barthok uh, legacy. And we we point out to to a slide with the uh, there's a map there where Bartok did research, but there's also one page of a song that we actually uh, reimagined on our album and it's on, on the album and it's called uh, What a Wonderful Night It Is, A Great Messiah Has Come. Let's move forward, please. And Mahela, before you press play, this is an excerpt of the same dowry song that we played at the local castle in, uh, in Sinicola Omare. Mahela, please just let it go for just under a minute because I don't want to spend too much time on this. Thank you. 
And let's move forward to the next slide. Uh, on the left, we have uh, uh, we have jo uh, John Sermon and Matt at a rehearsal in the Baroque Hall where we recorded the album. On the right, we have a photo with uh, the three of us by the great uh, uh, Romanian photographer Mircea Albuciu. Let's move forward, please. And we skip the next video. Let's move forward. And, uh, no, no, please, let's move forward to the next uh, slide. Thank you, Mahela. Uh, this is those are the the inside covers of our album, and uh, I just want to point out to to the city, uh, the designer Rebecca Mick did a, an amazing job using Transylvanian motives on the CD on the album, and on the inside left cover there's a quote from Bartok's text that I found amazing, and uh, I I definitely had to use it, and I'm going to read it. Peasant music in the strict sense of the word must be regarded as a natural phenomenon. The forms in which manifests itself are due to the instinctive transforming power of a community entirely devoid of erudition. Correspondingly, it has in its individual parts an absolute artistic perfection, a perfection in miniature forms, which one might say is equal to the perfection of a musical masterpiece of the largest proportion. This is from a text that he wrote on the uh, relation between folk song, uh, folk music, and the development of the art of music uh, in our time in 1921. And let's move forward to the last slide. And before you press play, this is an excerpt from uh, our performance in uh, June in Portugal at Barrio Euro Festival. We finally got to pr present the trio live after three years of pandemic. Uh, the moment the album came out, uh, uh, to my pleasant surprise, got uh, amazing uh, feedback from the press and, you know, and won a lot of awards. NPR did a piss on it. And su subsequently, we got a lot of invitations for festivals in Europe, mostly Europe, actually. All of those had to be canceled. The pandemic changed everything. Uh, then uh, uh, there were health issues. Then... Uh, Münster Festival in Germany uh, invited us each year uh, in 2020, 2021, and each time the city canceled live events. And finally, in June this year, we got to go to Portugal and we performed uh, on, on a big stage outdoor. And of course, after we got COVID, both me and John Sermon not met, but we are all fine now. And in fall, we're going to tour again Europe. We're going to play Berlin Jazz Festival. We're going to play Luxembourg and more. But uh, let's press play. This is a short one minute excerpt, and then we can move to questions. And uh, I'm sorry if the talking part was too long. Okay. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, so if there are any questions, uh, I'm, I'm right here to answer them. And thank you so much for bearing with me. I'm looking now at the time. This was too long. I hope it was not too much of a burden for you guys. Uh, I think that was great. And I'm sure everyone appreciated going a little over time so that they could, could learn about all of this. That was really uh, fantastic, Lucian. Thank you. Um, Great to have insight into this part of, of Bar Talk's life and learn more about um, your work with it as well. Uh, so everyone feel free to, if you have a question, go ahead and, and unmute your microphone to ask your question. Or again, um, if you wanna put it into the ch chat, I can read them aloud. Hi, Lucian. Um, thank you so much. It was a, a very uh, thorough and well-documented presentation. Um, thank you. I enjoyed it. Um, one of the, I've been to uh, Transylvania and, uh, as we say in Hungarian, Erde. So this is this is interesting to me that uh, that Bartok's focus seemed to be uh, oh, his focus was the culture, and I I always assumed that that culture was Hungarian and not Romanian in terms of the areas that he traveled in. But I got the impression from your presentation that it especially during that era, uh, that, that early era. Um, um, so was he documenting Romanian uh, folk culture and practice or Hungarian folk culture and practice? In Transylvania, at that time, what we call today Transylvania, he collected exclusively Romanian folk music because, because the Hungarians uh, music the Hungarian was uh, was the class that was sort of running things, and their music was not authentic. So mm -hmm. there was it was much more uh, what's the word? It was much more popular music stuff that like you know like you would hear in coffee places. Mm -hmm. So he was uh, Bartok was uh, fascinated about the purity of Romanian folk music, and he actually uh, as a method he did not collect uh, what is a big uh, uh, a big part of of music that was happening in the 19th century, which is the music of the soldiers, mm -hmm. the music of the gypsies, and uh, the music. Uh, there's other music and the popular music that stuff that was being played in coffee places, mm -hmm. you know, because there was there's an entire uh, tradition of music coming from the great composers like Mozart and everybody, every, people like those. That then they were pop, they were made popular songs into and they were played in coffee places and this was the middle lower middle class and middle class but the music that spoke to Bartok and which we now know that it's so deep and profound it's this music that is pure of peasants so he collected exclusively in Transylvania uh, the songs of Romanian folk people and he was in love with this and he learned Romanian and he learned so, so he can transcribe the lyrics mm -hmm. so yeah to answer your question, he collected exclusively Romanian folk music. And as I showed on that slide, the most songs that he collected in his entire life was Romanian folk songs, way more than Hungarian, which was the second in terms of numbers. Great, thank you for the explanation. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Eileen. Well, when, when Bartok was collecting this, 1900, Seven to 1917, it was all the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It wasn't the 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 country lines that we know of today didn't come into effect until 1920. So um, he was doing this all in one country, and he was looking at it regionally, ethnically, rather than nationally, as as um, the question posed it. He did collect a lot of Hungarian stuff as. Um, as was mentioned, but um, yes, he had the most luck in Transylvania. Can you just repeat what is the question? 
the question that the the the, the, the pre question that the gentleman asked was did he collect Romanian or did he collect Hungarian and he co he collected both he collected more Romanian than anything else I mean Romanian Transylvanian but that was because um, he had the best I mean he spent a lot of time in Transylvania he felt that was the most fertile ground so in what we call today's Romania which uh, uh, in Transylvania he collected exclusively Romanian folk music the Hungarian folk songs that he collected were, were collections that he did in, Hung in today's Hungary, in what we call the area of today's Hungary. But in Romania, he collected ex almost exclusively, I, I would say over 95% Romanian folk music. He did collect and did a separate study, the music of the Sekeli people, which is in even Eastern of Trans, uh, it's, it's actually on the Eastern side of Transylvania. There's a big community of uh, Hungarian speaking people that were concentrated in two uh, large counties uh, that we have today as well, the big uh, concentration. And it's called the music of the Sekeli people, Sekui, as we call them in Romania. So, but that's a separate study. And it's, I think it's a couple hundred songs as opposed to 30, 3,700 songs of Romanian folk uh, 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 songs. So in Transylvania and what we call today uh, 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 what we call today Transylvania, because back in at the beginning of the century, it was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, he collected uh, folk songs of Romanian people. Uh, yeah, that's true. And I think he found in Transylvania that there, were, had, there was um, less, um, less exposure to the rest, uh, to, to, to um, civilization, if you will. I think he found the peasants there were more isolated, which that which was a very positive thing for him. He didn't want the he didn't want the music corrupted by um, urban music, and I think he, he had the, the best time in Transylvania than any place. You're completely right, and the reason for this is because the music was authentic and pure from this standpoint. That's why he spent so much time in those villages because, and we can hear it today. You can actually there's there's a there's a website in a, a Hungarian website that digitized a lot of the wax cylinders, and you can go and point, you can go and count this on what is today Romania and what is today Hungary, uh, and uh, you can point on of, on which songs to hear, and they are from which villages. But yes, the question, the answer, I'm just reinforcing what you said. It's he he enjoyed the, in those villages because the music was unaltered. It was in a pure form, like he mentions several times in his studies. Lucien, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Pavel. Hi, how are you? Wonderful Good. job, wonderful job reimagining some of uh, uh, Bella Bartok's song and for your, for your jazz CD. Um, the area of Transylvania, um, it's a fertile, fertile ground, as you mentioned, for a lot of musicians, and it reminds me a little bit of another famous musician, Liszt, who traveled there maybe a bit earlier, and I don't know he collected or he was inspired by the mu by the music or by the folk music of the area. Am I correct on that? So Liszt performed, as far as I know. Now, please, please uh, remember that I'm a I'm a jazz pianist and not an expert of late romantic. <laughs> Uh, musicians from Europe. I do know that Liszt performed in the same hall where we performed. He performed in Cluj in what is called uh, today the Ethnographic Transylvania Ethnographic Museum. He performed in Brasov uh, and what is called today the Reduta uh, Concert Hall, another uh, venue that I, uh, I had a chance to perform. And of course, Liszt was influenced like uh, 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 his peers from the era by folk music, like like uh, Brahms and all these people. I cannot speak if Liszt was influenced by the music in Transylvania of Romanian folk people. Okay. Uh, what I can say is that, because uh, maybe because I went so long talking about his research, um, I did not, first of all, I did not put, put a link uh, on where you can find my album. I sent just now, Mahela, an email to you. Maybe you can share it here copy the link on Bandcamp. 
I didn't have time to, to say, I'm just gonna say uh, one little phrase about this. So what we took, we took probably 15 or 20 songs, me and Matt Maneri, and we worked on them to bring them into our universe, which means to rearrange them from a standpoint of improvisation. Uh, and that meant that we had to allow a way of orchestration so we can do our own thing. We are not a chamber uh, music ensemble in the classical sense. We are not performing string quartets by Beethoven or Bartok or uh, chamber works. What we did, we took these songs and we rearranged them in such a way so we can improvise and recontextualize them for our approach to music, which involves improvisation. I was lucky to be able to, to work with uh, a legendary figure like John Sermon and the great viol American violinist Matt Maneri. So I just wanted to say that we took melodies that from, from Bartok's transcriptions and we manipulated them in, some of them we play them completely as he transcribed them. For example, what a wonderful night it is, a Messiah has come. And uh, this was arranged by Matt Maneri, and he said simple on, on, the, on, the, on the score for our uh, concert. Viola and bass clarinet play the melody as is. Piano improvises underneath and then takes over for a solo by itself. Now, when I researched this song, I realized it was recorded probably 10 or 15 kilometers uh, miles away from where I grew up, the village in Transylvania. Mm. And, uh, it was very moving for me because uh, Bartok collected mostly in Western Transylvania, but then he moved towards the center. And that's where I grew up, Cluj, and actually in a little village near Cluj, like probably like 80 miles near Cluj. And this song that is so moving and it's, it spoke to me and uh, on the album is dedicated to my father who passed away uh, uh, in early 2020. And uh, I just felt it spoke so much, but I wanted to mention the, liber the, the approach that we had to these folk songs, because we took some songs, we took beats, some songs we changed the melody a little, but we, because I had a chance to work with these tremendous musicians, we kept the spirit of the songs intact. That's, that was our goal. And I'm happy to announce that together with Jazz Update and Show, we are continuing the project this year as well and next year. So we are hoping to get another group of songs filtered to, to, to contemporary jazz ensembles. Um, let's, uh, we can do one more question if, if anyone has a, a one last question and then um, we'll look at closing up. Yeah, I do. Um, Franz Liszt was a Hungarian composer by um, by ethnic background, and I think you're thinking of his Hungarian rhapsodies, which were inspired by um, Hungarian folk songs. I'm not sure that he actually did any ethnomusicology, um, but but um, but he was inspired by his Hungarian background. Definitely. And Lucian, Lucian, I, I wanted to say that I've pass on your information to the organizers of the Rochester International Jazz Festival. And I hope they get in touch with you because I think your, they, um, I think your, your presentation would be, your group would be great for them. They, they hold a festival in Rochester, New York. Um, I know, I performed there in end of May during uh, the, I did a tour on, uh, on the Northeastern for my solo album and I performed there uh, at uh, the Bob shop. So. It's, and I think I performed there like at least four or five times with various groups. So it's a, it's a city mm -hmm. I love. So I would definitely be open to, to come up there or come to Saranac Lake everywhere, you know, to present okay. those things. Yes. Okay, that'd be great. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I was lucky enough to be in Romania when Chilabadachi returned to Bucharest for the first time. Uh, to perform, uh, you know, just a week or so after uh, after uh, the dictator was brought down. And um, I first went in 67 and I got lost everywhere. And I was lost in a lot of where you grew up. Um, I'm a photographer and 
I unfortunately didn't record because I would go to a, I would go and I would see people in trees playing music, you know, um, literally shading themselves by sitting in trees. Um, thank you very much. I would, I really like to talk to you more. Uh, we'll, we'll Is, uh, Mahela, can you put my email in the, in the... Sure, sure. Um, and uh, folks, folks, what I'll do is um, when I send out this recording to everyone who uh, registered, I will also share um, the link where you can can access his recordings on the Bandcamp site and um, his email, if that's okay with you, Lucian. Yes, definitely. Please. So, Nathan, thank you so much for 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 your uh, 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 insight. And did you? Did you travel after to Romania? Well, I first went to Romania in 67, and I spent a lot of time in that area. And I, I photographed so much, and I listened to so much wonderful music. And of course, absolutely. I mean, it was like going to a place that was preserved in... Um, What's the uh, the gem that preserves um, insects? I've had a stroke, so I don't remember names of things. Um, but it was totally pure. And uh, I just loved it. And I went back uh, three more times. I went back when uh, Ceausescu was brought down. And um, that was the last time. Yeah, and I went to uh, Suchava. Uh, okay. Six That's weeks also. Um, yeah, Moldavia. I would yeah. love to see some some of your photographs that you took uh, in those first trips of Romania. Yeah. Uh, what I I would really love. So please send me a, a link for that for those. I, I have somewhere online, or if if there's a book or or a uh, or a printed thing, uh, uh, if you printed any, if they appear in any uh, printed materials, uh, some of these photographs. I just did a very. I, I'm doing a complete thing of my 50, 60 years of photographing, and I just I will send you something. That you'll oh. be able to click on Romania and see the 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 tip the tip of it. But I will I will really send you a lot of of uh romania you know it was it was so amazing my grandfather had come from uh from yas and uh so he always talked about romania with a twinkle in his eyes and uh and uh it made me it made me go there uh it's amazing I, that you went there what i can say uh speaking connected to our subject is that Today, Romania is has changed tremendously, and yeah. some of it obviously is for for good because you know there's uh, we don't have a, a dictatorship anymore, uh, but uh, you know there's freedom and there's capitalism and free markets and everything, but there's things that you are losing. So what is getting lost is the isolation of the villages is getting lost, and the traditional culture is getting lost. So this, like the folk songs that I've heard on these wax cylinders do not sound almost at all what the folk music sounds today. So this speaks to how much uh, folk music and folk culture changes over a hundred years. It's, it's amazing. That's why uh, uh, work uh, or, or, and research like Bartok did has such an impact a tremendous importance. It's because they preserve things that are not there anymore. And we yeah. know this here with, uh, you know, Appalachian uh, ancient songs and with, you know, with American uh, uh, tradition. If you don't, if we, if we wouldn't have the Alan Lomax uh, field recordings, we would, we, we, we would be so much poor in terms of knowing the history of this place. So it's amazing that we have those things and it's amazing when people uh, you know, get connected to this, and you know, I, I, I wasn't a researcher. I, I got to this by chance, working with these people in Timisoara at Jazz Updates Organization, and, and I, I'm a jazz musician. I'm doing mostly something else, but I got so attracted to, to, to Bartok's lifelong passion for for Romanian folk culture that uh, 
I'm still in love and in awe today. And uh, I still hope to pursue, you know, to pursue this research. And I'm, I'm so moved when people from, I had people from Iran or from Brazil writing to me about the album. I never imagined that, you know, Bartok folk collected folk songs could get to those places, but yeah. yet they do. So we are all very much interconnected. So I think it's, it's amazing that uh, we can, we are able to share this. You know what I've what I expected a little bit more of was um, more um, that was pure pentatonic scale uh, because he introduced it, you know, to Western music, and I went to Novosibirsk in the middle of Siberia, and I was going to be working in a giant exhibition hall, and I walked into the hall way up high. And I'm listening to the women who are singing downstairs. And I was just totally knocked out. And I realized, yeah, I'm exactly halfway between Asia and Europe. And these, this, this local Siberian music is so pure. Uh, and I thought maybe, I thought maybe some of that had moved over. Um, I don't it know. Did. You know? Yeah, there's some on our album as well. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Bartok, if you remember, he says one thing about folk music, that all folk music throughout the world comes from the same cell. And he same motive, which is a motive of very few notes, which is kind of very close to a pentatonic scale, you know? And right. uh, there's, as I said, there's debate about this. I actually think it's true. Uh, all folk music throughout the world comes from the same source and if you go deeper enough you would find that it's it's a collection of notes that are arranged in a certain way and, and the genius of folk music and folk musician is that they can imagine endless possibilities out of this music if you look at the pygmy music in africa the uh, the healers' music in in the south of the United States, the music in Asia, it's you can find the same origin. It look it sounds different, but it's the same origin. So yes, there is pentatonic stuff even on our album. Uh, just you know, uh, uh, go and listen to it. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to talking to you more. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you, Seb. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be sure to be sure to con, um, connect you two over email at the end and share um, all of the links and everything as well when the recording goes out. Um, so thank you everyone, those, those that are still here for attending. And thank you so much, Lucian, for sharing all of your research and your work with us. It was really wonderful to hear about it. And I know everyone appreciated it greatly. Um, so thank you for your time. And uh, once again, head to the events page on our website um, for more information about this program series this summer. So it's a pleasure and an honor to do this with uh, Historic Saranac Lake. And thank you for preserving part of there and for all of us, you know, and thanks everyone for joining us and for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you and good night. <laughs>